communism has failed if they produce something like the Germans, who, who had created this horrible mess over there. Right. And so uh, there was a lot of, of concern that, well, maybe we should go back to basics. And there was a, a religious re revival at the time, and fundamentalism was part of it. So um, William Jennings Bryan uh, was a very interesting man, and I think I think he's he's been treated poorly by history. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the view of Brian has been colored by uh, Inherit the Wind, yeah. uh, which was a wonderful play, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the movie that was made uh, of it uh, was was an, an excellent movie. But it really had very little do, to do with the Scopes trial. Uh, if you want a, a really good treatment of the Scopes trial, take a look at Ed Larson's book, Summer of the Gods. Summer of the um, Gods. It, it w won the Pulitzer in history a few wow. years back, and it's it's really gripping. It's so much more exciting, actually, than uh, uh, Inherit the Wind, <laughs> if you can imagine. Uh, so Inherit the Wind is wonderful theater, but the real Scopes tri trial was much more gripping. Mm. William Jennings Bryan was a progressive. Uh, he would fit in very well in Berkeley today, which is where I'm from. He was for women's suffrage. He was for a decent shake for working men. Working men should only have to work eight hours a day. Okay. He was against the robber barons. He was against the exploitation of workers. He, was, uh, he didn't think that children should have to work in factories. He thought that they should be able to go to school. Who, who knew? Who knew? Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh and the main reason why he was against evolution Yes, uh, he was a religious man, and he felt that the Bible was a good moral guide and all that, and, and he didn't like the fact that evolution uh, contradicted the, the literal genesis. But the main reason why William Jennings Bryan didn't like evolution is he felt that evolution um, destroyed the idea of God and, and led people to all of those wicked things that uh, Andrew Carnegie and all the other robber barons were predicting. Nature, red and tooth and claw. Yeah, I was it was bring the that social up. Darwinism. Social, yeah. yeah. And there was a lot of that confusion back then. A lot of the people that we would consider progressives, a lot of the people who today would be considered liberals, rejected evolution because they confused it with social Darwinism. And I mean, there was a big reason for that, with, with, like we were talking about before, with Hitler and, and Germany and this, you know... No, this was well before. Before? Okay, okay. This was 1925. This was 1925. the early 20s. So this okay. was well before, before Hitler. And... Well before any of that. Yeah. But it was the time of the eugenics movement. Eugenic. yeah, I wanted to talk about that. And you, um, so I had specific questions about And also that. remember that the science of evolution wasn't nearly as well grounded back in the late teens and early 20s as it is now. This was before the genetic underpinnings of evolution was really understood. You know, and we, you know, we, the idea of evolution as common ancestry was well understood, but the actual mechanisms of evolution, the actual mechanisms of natural selection was not nearly as well understood because we didn't know anything about genetics. Right. That didn't happen really until the middle 20, the middle part 50s, of the 20th yeah, century. Yeah, Watson and Crick, 53. Um, so, yeah, that brings us to this now kind of second wave of understanding and um, people like, you know, when I was in college, I was given a copy of The Selfish Gene and you get to the end and they start talking about, you know, trying to derive some kind of moral imperatives from evolution and it kind of, you kind of just get this, oh, are we going back to the eugenics movement here? And then, and then you're like, no, I mean, I, I think... So well, Dawkins isn't uh, trying to do that. I mean, he's no. very clear about that. Right. That, that, that's the that's the naturalistic fallacy that he's very clear about. You should not do. Okay. Yeah. That, and that what was the is, question. What is not what ought to be. Yes. So yeah, that was the question. Do you think it's a fallacy to to, to try to attempt to derive moral imperatives from nature? No, of course not. Um, what is that wonderful line from? Um, uh, Senior moment here, uh, the African Queen. You know, nature, nature uh, is what we are put into this world to rise above. <laughs> the wonderful thing about being Homo sapiens and a creature that adapts to its environment using learned behavior and culture is that we don't have to do what our genes tell us to do. We can, we can rise above our genes. As we can look at what our genes tell us to do and say, no, we're not going to do it that way. Um, what, 
what morals and ethics are about is the oughts. What uh, biology about is what is. And we should never confuse what is with what ought to be. What, what is does not determine what ought to be. We can decide what ought to be and act upon it. We are not governed by what is as human beings. Other creatures may be, but we are not. So with that thought in mind, where are the, the oughts derived? The oughts are derived variously by different cultures. In some cultures, they are derived through religion. Subcultures derive their oughts from what they consider revealed truth by their gods, by their god, by their ancestor spirits. Many uh, religions, or many societies, uh, interestingly enough, don't derive their oughts from supernatural causes, for supernatural forces. They derive it from tradition, that you should behave this way because that's the way we've always done it. And it's and, obviously been survivable to do that. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, and I think that's an important point because many people believe that the only source of the oughts, the only source of morals and ethics, uh, come from um, supernatural, come from God or gods. And actually, anthropologically, that's not always so. Uh, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there are societies and I can't think of any right now because I haven't thought about this for a long time. It's been a long time since I've uh, been a college professor and taught this sort of stuff. But there are societies, you can go to the human relation area files which are online and you can look this stuff up. Uh, but there are societies where just tradition determines such things as how you are supposed to behave, how ethics and morals are supposed to act. But the majority of human societies do derive these laws through supernatural forces. But there has been a long history um, in human society of, of non-supernaturally derived ethics. And the Greeks certainly derived them from um, both um, the gods uh, telling you how to behave as well as from tradition. Well, that's one of the, the you mentioned the Greeks and automatically my mind thinks of um, this speech by Doris Kearns Goodwin where she's talking about Abraham Lincoln and his moral philosophy and he didn't believe in an afterlife. Mm. And he so, but he, there was this old Greek philosophy that, you know, your spirit goes on in the effects that you put out there when you are on earth, either by your writings or your actions or, or whatever it may be. Um, I, I, I'm trying to form a question around that, but, like, do you think that that understanding is detrimental, that type of approach? Is a detrimental approach, or do you think that it that you can still have moral imperative even if you don't believe in an afterlife? Um, there are human societies which don't have afterlife. I mean, um, as I understand it, uh, Buddhism doesn't have an afterlife, and there are hundreds of millions of, of human beings on the planet who are Buddhists, they seem to do just fine in terms of living moral and ethical lives. So I think we have empirical evidence that that's not a problem. But I think one of the, um, one of the nice uh, comparative statistics that you can look at is that virtually every human society that's ever been studied has some version of what we would call the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. You can find that in the in the Christian Bible, uh, which is the Jewish Old Testament. Um, the um, uh, variations of that, sometimes it's don't do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you. It can be phrased either way, uh, either positively or negatively. Uh, but when you, th if you want to look at that from the st as, as a biologist would look at it, if you want to look at it from the standpoint of a natural selective uh, model. Uh, what societies are more likely to uh, survive amongst, uh, you know, not to put it in a necessarily a group selective kind of model, but, you know, with a group of societies, what, what, society, what populations are more likely to, to leave copies of themselves, shall we say, over a period of survive. time? Survive. Yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps the 